Hello, my name is Victor Castro. I'm a data scientist at Mass General Brigham in Boston. And the title of my talk today is Assessing uh, Machine Learning Model Performance in Diverse Populations and Across Time. And the focus of the talk uh, is lessons learned um, in developing and uh, replicating a machine learning model that we built uh, in the earlier part of the pandemic uh, back in March. Uh, well, the, the model was developed uh, around June of 2020 based on hospitalizations uh, in uh, the Mass General Brigham healthcare system, uh, which encompasses six, six hospitals, academic medical centers and community hospitals. And we used uh, predictors from laboratory uh, tests, results, uh, prior medical history, and um, some vitals and other uh, demographic information to train the model. Um, and so I, uh, the, the model itself um, is, was using a data set of 2,511 uh, admissions. Uh, and we used a uh, lasso regression uh, using the tidy models package, uh, which I highly recommend. Um, makes things nice and clean and also really helped with uh, replication uh, six months later. Um, and specifically, we use the GLMNet engine uh, of the tidy models uh, 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 workflow. Um, and again, the predictors included demographics, prior medical history, lab results, and vitals at presentation. So typically that was at the emergency room, but it could have been when they were transferred from another hospital. Uh, and so the way we did the training and the test was uh, we used three hospitals that kind of uh, feed to each other. So there's two community uh, health centers, community hospitals that uh, kind of feed into one academic medical center. We have uh, two different of those set situations. So we use one as the training, which so that had one academic medical center and two community hospitals. And then we used a test set, which had, again, one academic medical center and two community hospitals. And um, the, the these are kind of the demographics. And so the training set was it's about two thirds uh, of, the, of the data. Um, and uh, I'll show you this table just because uh, it's going to come come up later in the talk, uh, an important point of the talk. Um, but you'll see there's 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 a pretty good distribution, um, as as is widely known. Um, you know, the, especially in the earlier part of the pandemic, uh, the, the older older people were being admitted more more often, uh, and there was actually over. Um, uh, different different ethnicities and race were also overrepresented compared to our typical hospital population. Uh, and then I just point out this, the, the, the model was trained to predict two things. There's two different outcomes, two different models. One is uh, COVID-19 severity, which uh, was defined as either an ICU admission, um, mechanical ventilation, uh, or death, and then a second model, which was just uh, uh, mortality, so death at outcome. Uh, and so uh, overall, we had 11% of patients that died uh, and 18% that had a severe, uh, severe outcome. Uh, and here's how the models, the finals model looked. Again, this, this paper is published in JAMA Network Open. It was published last summer. Um, and um, the, the number of predictors, there was actually quite a few predictors that were, were fed into the lasso uh, engine. Um, and uh, these were the kind of the final models. One column is for the severe illness model and the other one is for the mortality model. Uh, and you'll see age is, is a strong component, um, baseline oxygen, some lab tests, uh, prior history of, of respiratory infections, COPD, that kind of thing. Uh, nothing super surprising here. Um, uh, and the model performs, the models performed very, pretty well. So we had uh, an AUC of 0.807 for the uh, mortality model and 0.847 for the um, severe outcome model. And, and I show one graph here, it's a Kaplan Meyer survival curves. Uh, 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 splitting up the model predictions into quintiles. So this, this bottom line here uh, is the, the top uh, quintile of risk. 
um, which is what we usually generally use as our cutoffs so of the top 20 percent of predictions. Um, and you'll see that that, uh, that line actually does differentiate and the, the x axis here is um, time since uh, since uh, presentation so admission or presentation to the emergency room. Uh, and so this is the severe outcome model. So you'll see it actually separates quite nicely. So we are really excited to see this. Um, and then, uh, so that was published in uh, in June and uh, or, or in the summer, or I'm sorry, in October, uh, based on data through June. Uh, and then uh, earlier part of this year, we decided to look back and say, okay, uh, the, the pandemic has changed quite a bit. Uh, and we had different waves. And, and at the time, we were kind of in a second wave of the winter wave in New England, um, which was different than the first. Uh, and so we're saying we were looking at how well does the model perform, uh, given all these changes that were happening. Um, and so we we recently just actually published a paper as a research letter in, again, JAMA Network Open, which is a follow up, uh, looking at that. And so this is kind of the lessons learned and um, kind of the focus of this talk. Um, how we did that, and um, I'm hoping to, I'm going to get into some uh, R code, hopefully, to share some some tools and, and make that available. Um, and that, again, that's using uh, uh, the yardstick package, which is part of tidy models, uh, which is really nice. Um, so this is again is table one, and it, it looking at comparing patients from the initial training set, which is March, uh, April, May primarily, uh, and then a replication, which is uh, the subsequent period. Um, and really, as we expected, there were kind of big differences. Um, the the difference in um, age, uh, differences in uh, specifically. Um, Ethnicity, so there were quite a few more Hispanic patients in the first wave compared to the second uh, or the subsequent waves. Um, and, um, and notably, um, there was a significant drop in our outcome. So uh, as you remember, the number that was 18% uh, of severe illness in the first wave, but when we, in the subsequent time period that was dropped down to 8.3%. And similarly, uh, death, the outcome of death was 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 ha almost half uh, of what it used to be. So that that was, of course, great, great news. Um, uh, but we want to see how our model performed, and especially because uh, linear models like la lasso regression uh, is, is, is pretty uh, 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 sensitive to changes in outcomes. Um, and, and this is another kind of view of, of how the outcome changed from the graph on the left is the proportion of severe by month. Uh, and the blue box describes the, the initial training uh, set, the time period for the training set. Uh, and you'll see the, the earlier parts were quite higher uh, and slowly dropped down. And then it kind of became stable uh, after that initial training. Um, and again, that's really good. And, and so uh, this is kind of the crux table of this talk. And uh, aside from the outcome changes, um, we wanted to look at how the model performed uh, across different subgroups. Uh, and we define kind of subgroups by gender, uh, age groups, uh, race, ethnicity, uh, and whether they were admitted to uh, one of the academic medical centers or community hospital. And again, this left quadrant here uh, describes the original, um, the performance in the original test set. And uh, you'll see the AUCs were sometimes better, sometimes worse. Uh, but we, we actually didn't really look into this the first time around. Uh, and this is one of the big lessons learned here is that we were actually quite underrepresented in our initial set uh, in terms of some groups. So in the initial uh, wave, there are actually no patients under 50 that, that died. Uh, and you know, in the, in the subsequent waves, there were seven. Um, and we predicted that, but you know, there, there was really no way that the model could really do well in that. There was, it, was, it was never in the training set that, that there was any patients in those groups. Similarly, a few uh, Asian patients, um, 
and some really small numbers with the outcome uh, in, in this initial set. Uh, and while the model performed really well in, um, in this training set, in the, test, in the test set from the training period, um, uh, with, with, and again, this is PPVs and specificity sensitivities uh, in the top uh, quintile. Um, when we got to the evaluation set, which again was the subsequent period, um, the AUCs actually held pretty well. So this group where we didn't actually have any patients uh, under 50, uh, the AUC was, was pretty poor. Um, and the biggest drop we saw was in PPV. Uh, and again, that is probably where it is because of the change in outcomes, um, the significant drop in outcomes. And so, uh, and again, quite a few, quite a bit of difference in, in the different subgroups. Um, so you'll see uh, compared to the Hispanics, uh, PP 0.13, non-Hispanics 0.23, whereas in the kind of original set, we had it a little bit closer. Um, and so I encourage you to look at the paper, look at the results. Uh, and so I wanted to show you, since this is an R conference, uh, how I did this and how relatively easy it is to do this with the yardstick package, uh, which has been kind of a game changer for, for our work. Uh, and so I will show you, this is kind of a, this is a, a dummy version of, of our data set, but you know, we have one row basically per admission per patient. Um, and then you have your categories here. Um, this is the view from, from our studio. Um, you have your categories, so how you want to break it down, and then one row per patient. And then this is the, the true outcome, whether they actually had the outcome. Um, uh, and, and again, this could be, uh, in, in our case, it was either death or um, uh, severe illness uh, before discharge. Uh, and then this model class is, um, the model prediction. Uh, and, that, and this is, again, based on the cutoff of the top quintile. Um, you know, you can also have a, a, a um, continuous prediction, which you can use to calculate the AUC, uh, just for brevity. I'm not going to show that here. But I, I will mention that putting this, making sure that you uh, maintain the same uh, parameters from uh, training into the evaluation is not trivial. Uh, so there, there are quite a few steps, as we know, uh, from generating the data, transforming the data. Um, and the Tiny Models package does make it great because you can just create that workflow uh, in um, uh, while you're doing the training and then save that. And, and so you, you want to save the model, uh, but not, not just the model. You also want to save the, the transformations of the predictors. Uh, and then also the cutoffs that you use um, from your from your from your training set, uh, and, and you put, pull those through because you you don't want to take the top quintile, for example, of the predictions in the in the evaluation set because that's that's not fair. Um, so uh, again, the yardstick package is what we use, and uh, it's just a few lines of code. So you could just load the yardstick package, and I have the URL there, and then you can define your um, class metrics. So these are the uh, the, the ones you saw on the table. So specificity, sensitivity, PPV, and PV. And that's a metric set. Um, and then uh, I'll walk you through a little bit of this code. Uh, so you, the D is the, the table you saw earlier. Uh, and we pivot that to be longer. So you have one row per patient per subgroup. Uh, you group by the subgroups and then you use the dplyr uh, uh, nesting function. Uh, and then you... Um, do a, a map across uh, the different uh, nests and basically apply these this class metrics function, uh, passing in the truth, uh, which that the second to last column and the last column in the in the in the data frame that you saw. Uh, and then once you do that, you basically have your results and you can unnest them and then pivot wider. And this is how it looks, um, similar to the table. Pretty few lines of code, uh, and this works with large data sets um, pretty efficiently. Um, and again, the you can calculate AUCs a little trickier, uh, but not much more so. And uh, also, confidence intervals can be calculated uh, as well. So this brings me to some conclusions. Uh, number one. Um, our COVID-19 risk prediction model maintained good discrimination. The AUC was comparable 
between the training uh, period and the, and the replication period. Uh, but the calibration was diminished by the sharp reduction in, in outcome of COVID severity, uh, COVID severe disease, and uh, death. Uh, and, and probably to fix this, uh, we, we would need to do some recalibration uh, of the model. Uh, and the second thing is that assessment of the model performance over time is quite useful and interesting. Uh, it was really worthwhile to understand what was happening. Uh, and we would advocate for a, a lot more of that happening, especially in the literature, uh, where we see quite a few uh, publications with clinical risk prediction models, um, uh, but very little uh, replication or assessment uh, in other sites or, or, or even within the same site across time. Um, and uh, the, the last point is uh, probably the, the most important. It's uh, is to assess the risk stratification models across the patient subgroups. Uh, and we didn't do this the first time around. We didn't actually look at uh, what, what, uh, what our data look like by subgroups and specifically um, how represented they are with the outcome, uh, which, which um, had a significant uh, impact on performance in those subgroups uh, in both the test set and the replication set. Uh, and so hopefully here I can show you an approach to do that with your own modeling, uh, pretty straightforward to, to look at that. Um, and, and it's super important because we just need to, to, to pay attention to make sure that these kind of uh, modeling approaches uh, operationalize in, in clinical settings don't adversely impact uh, subgroups uh, that might be underrepresented. Um, and so uh, I want to call out uh, one interesting paper in the literature by Mark Sendak at Duke, um, where he looks at um, uh, presenting uh, the sort of like a kind of a drug label for for models, uh, which I thought was really nice. Uh, and I, I put here, he has an example in his paper, which I have a link for down at the bottom. Um, and it looks like a drug label and it just basically says, okay, this is how the model works. This is how it's trained. Um, this is kind of a limitations. And so understanding the limitations of what population it was trained on uh, can be communicated in this kind of thing. And this is a way more detailed than, uh, for example, what you see in the, in the tripod recommendations uh, for publishing uh, model models uh, in, in the literature. Uh, so I think this is really cool. I'm hoping to, to work on look at this, this approach more in, in the future. And some other just sort of thoughts uh, that just looking at, I saw on Twitter recently, uh, a nice discussion, which I have this link here, um, about what what do modeling choices impact performance in uh, subgroups that are underrepresented in the data. Uh, so the kind of the, the 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 excuse I would say usually used is that there's not enough data for these underrepresented subgroups, uh, and that is true that there is less data typically for, for a number of reasons. Um, but that's not the only excuse that bias exists. Uh, and modeling choices do have quite a bit of impact as well as transformations of data set of predictors and uh, other things. And this is a nice diagram of, of where all those biases can be introduced uh, and kind of ways to approach that. So um, encourage you to look at that. Uh, and then just some thoughts about maybe um, figuring out ways to uh, optimize models uh, for representativeness uh, in under underrepresented populations. Um, and I know there's quite a bit of work happening on that. So I look forward to that. Um, so uh, thank you for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.